All righty, everybody. <laughs> to our Nature Connection Lunch and Learn series for today. We are really excited to be talking about moths and Moth Week um, and just really, really cool things. Um, I wanted to just remind everybody that after this week, we have one more week um, of this uh, series. So next week, we're going to be talking about Watch, which is a really great citizen science program as well. Um, after that, we are going to take a break for the summer um, with the Lunch and Learns, um, and then we'll probably start up again in the fall. Um, we have our busy summer camp this summer, so we're, we need to take a little bit of a break from this. Um, but hopefully everyone can then, instead of coming to our Lunch and Learns, get outside, enjoy nature, definitely come and visit our site. Every time I walk around, this time of year is so amazing. There's just beautiful things blooming and lots of stuff to see. So. You know, come out, you know, take a walk, you know, just sit on one of the benches and watch the bird feeders and see what's there. Um, it's defi definitely, definitely worth it. We're seeing great amounts of people coming out and we, we'd love to have them there. Um, a couple other things, um, just to sort of let people know, if anyone is interested in, um, in a little bit of running, a little bit of exercise, um, we are having our, um, our annual 5K, um, our Raptor Run 5K on June 2nd. Um, we run the property, we run the trails, um, it's beautiful. Usually the weather's nice, we do it on a Wednesday evening, um, so then afterwards we can have um, some beer and some water and some food and hang out a little bit. Um, on our big giant back patio where we can socially distance just fine. Um, so hopefully if you know people who are interested in running, um, they'll come out and do that. It's a really, really fun, lovely event. It's a nice sort of slightly different way of using our property um, than our regular programs, but always, um, everyone always loves it. And, and I've looked ahead as the weather and it looks like it's supposed to be nice. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, all right, I think those are my main um, sort of things for today. Um, again, thank you all for coming so much. Um, we have a wonderful speaker. Um, Elena's gonna be talking to us um, all about moss, um, which should be really, really cool. And I'm gonna let her introduce herself and, and, um, and get started. So take it away, Elena. Hi, thanks for coming. And also thanks for having me. I'm Elena Tartaglia, and I am a professor at Bergen Community College in Northern New Jersey. So great to join you via Zoom today. I'm a professor of biology uh, and I uh, have done for the past 10 years worked on a global scale citizen science project called National Moth Week, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today and also about uh, moth ecology and conservation in general. So let me um, share my screen and we um, will get started on the presentation. So I always call my talk Strangers in the Night, Moths in Your Backyard. Uh, and this is my email in case you want to contact me later and I'll show that again at the end. Um, and we'll get into the strangers part in a little bit, but the first things I wanted to do was introduce my citizen science or community science project called National Moth Week, which is in its 10th year, which is amazing to me how time flies. Um, and Moth Week is a week that we take every year. It's the last full week in July, and this year will be July 17th through 25th. And we've got a website, nationalmothweek.org, um, if you'd like to check out more information on that. And so what Moth Week is, is an invitation to the public to participate in a data gathering program, right? And so the point of these citizen science or community science projects is to really hammer home the point that science doesn't have to be done by scientists in a lab apart from the world or apart from the general public and that um, people who are non-scientists can make meaningful contributions to the way that data is gathered. And in fact, it's so helpful because in terms of moth scientists, there's a handful of us in the world, right? And we can only collect so much data. And so it's really invaluable to have members of the public contributing to our research projects. And the point of Moth Week is to highlight um, this aspect of biodiversity that is maybe less loved uh, and sort of maybe underappreciated for, the, for some stuff that I'm gonna get into in a minute and also for the fact that they come out at night, which is not when most of us are awake. Even me as a moth scientist, um, staying up late can be a little hard, but it's, it's great fun. And so nationalmothweek.org is where you can go and you can actually, we have a map of all of our 
um, programs that we give. We, we do both public and private events. People all over the world just sign up, whether they're hosting an event at a nature center or a private event in your backyard. And so if you're interested in hosting something, which like I said, can be as little as you're sitting next to your porch light drinking um, a lemonade or whatever, uh, to these bigger programs at nature centers if you'd like to find something in your area to participate in. Um, and so a little bit about uh, Moth Week's data, right? So Moth Week, uh, again, started 10 years ago now. And in the last few years, we've really taken off by um, sort of collaborating with this app, which I don't know if you, I think you pretty, probably uh, know about, a smartphone app called iNaturalist. And iNaturalist has been invaluable to us in the gathering of data in that any moth um, photos uploaded during the week will actually automatically be pulled into our Moth Week project. This is just an interface from um, 2020, 2021 coming soon. Um, and so we can gather, uh, so last Moth Week, we had over 50,000 data points of observations of moths. And in that way, you know, we, we have several science goals of the project um, in terms of tracking moth biodiversity on a worldwide scale, in terms of tracking their phenology, in other words, their active time during the year and how is that changing through time, um, and whether or not species that were once common are not as common anymore. And in 2020, we had 915 events in 53 countries, and that's you know during a pandemic. So it's really uh, a, a really awesome event to be a part of. And it honestly grew out of um, small mothing events that we used to do in East Brunswick, New Jersey, that we'd invite people to come and look at our moth sheets. And a couple of times we were like, wouldn't it be cool to host a moth night that all of New Jersey participated in? And then as the night progressed and you get sort of loopier <laughs> as it gets later, we thought, why not stop in New Jersey? Why not the whole United States? And then we were like, why not the whole world? And so we put it out there and had such an incredible response, even in the first few years. So that's a little overview of Moth Week. Um, I highly encourage you to participate, even if it's just uploading some photos that'll be swept into our project. Um, and in the beginning, we had a little, little trouble getting people on board with Moth Week. And so um, Greta Van Susteren is a conservative commentator. Actually, don't even, this is from a little while ago. I don't know what she's up to these days. But in 2013, published a little uh, article on her blog complaining, do we really need this, a National Moth Week? I'm in favor of science and learning, but a National Moth Week? And then, after I brought that up at one of my moth talks and the Philadelphia Inquirer published it, she actually issued an apology. So I don't know if we're maybe the first group on earth to receive an apology from a Fox News commentator. Um, and she said, I apologize for making fun of National Moth Week, which was very nice of her. And so moth, you know, one of the goals of our citizen science project is to bring awareness to this lesser appreciated facet of biodiversity. And so moths do need kind of a media image makeover. And so some of the representations of moths in the media throughout the last couple of decades have mostly been negative. So a very, very famous um, horror movie, which I actually haven't seen because I'm too scared. Uh, one of the scariest movies of all time, I'm told, The Silence of the Lambs prominently features moths. And um, I had to read a synopsis of this, but uh, one of, um, in this movie, a serial killer, uh, his kind of signature is to place a pupa of a moth into the mouths of his victims, and they would hatch out when the victims were found. And this is a, an actual real moth called a death's head hawk moth. Um, and here's what it looks like in real life. It has a little stage makeup on for its movie poster, but this is a real moth. And so it was, um, it's kind of, firmly um, entwined in identity with this horror movie. Another horror movie called The Mothman Prophecies, I love that it's just based on 
true events, um, features this cryptozoological entity called the Mothman, who um, has been said to terrorize young teenagers in West Virginia and other places. And so another uh, scary movie uh, based on moths, The Mothman Prophecy. And of course, no mention of moths would be complete without talking about Mothra versus Godzilla, of course. Um, and, you know, there's a series of Mothra movies and sometimes Mothra is a good guy and sometimes Mothra is a bad guy, but these are the perceptions that the public has via the media of these creatures. And it's true that moths are often thought of only as pests, and some of them are. And, you know, I'm not here to say that every moth is a beautiful and special creature that I would have personally as a pet. But some of some moths, a small handful of species are pests. If you're a gardener, you're familiar with the tomato hornworm, which can really devastate um, garden tomatoes. These are gypsy moths, which are a major pest um, of northeast forests. They can cause mass defoliation. And of course, the suite of grain moths and um, others of that type that can infest your home as a mild annoyance if, if you, know, you don't keep your grains and bird seed um, stored properly. And then of course, the number one thing that I get asked or told when I say that I research moths is, oh, I don't like those, I hate all of all moths because they eat my sweaters, right? And in reality, there's between two and five species of moths out of the hundreds of thousands in the world that actually can do damage to sweaters. And this one depicted here is not even close to one of them. So moths are often thought of only as pests but they really do play essential roles in ecosystems when we get into some of those. Um, first and foremost, decomposition. This is just one of hundreds of species of what we call leaf litter moths that occur in uh, the Northeast. And decomposition is an essential ecosystem function in that the breakdown of leaf litter, fallen leaves in the autumn, when these leaves fall, they're full of nutrients, right, that the tree has taken out of the soil. And the way to get those nutrients back into soil and maintain um, soil nutri nutrient properties is decomposition. And moths, along with many other creatures, um, bacteria, fungi, et cetera, are part of this decomposition crew that enables nutrients to cycle back and maintain soil fertility. And in fact, clothes moths, in, in the world, in the real world, are part of this leaf litter decomp, uh, or actually animal protein decomp, decomposition set. Moths are important linkages in food webs. So in other words, they feed bats, they feed lizards, they feed birds, and we'll get more into that in a second. And even bears and foxes have been known to eat moths. So they're um, essential linkages in food webs. Now to say a little bit more about birds and Lepidoptera in particular, caterpillars have been, um, you know, in the past decade or so, research are really realizing that caterpillars are one of the absolute main diets that birds collect for their nestlings and that nestlings in some species, in particular chickadees, are reared almost entirely on caterpillars. And so these are, you know, moths, you know, we, we say, where should you care about bugs? Bugs are bird food, it's a selling point. But in fact, they are, they are a major, major contributor to nestling success because what is a caterpillar? It's a little sack of fat and protein, right? That is not only um, easy to digest, but it's also soft bodied as opposed to kind of other insects that have the chitin exoskeleton in the way that caterpillars haven't formed yet in their development. And so uh, particularly to bird nestling success is having a steady diet of caterpillars. Moths are pollinators, um, similar to bees. They carry pollen around, enabling plants to do sexual reproduction. And sexual reproduction allows plants to maintain genetic diversity and, ad and adaptability in a changing world. 
And a moth is a little bit of a different pollinator from a bee in that moths feed with a straw-like mouth part called a proboscis. And so they can only actually drink the nectar from flowers. And they don't eat any pollen the way that bees do. Um, and which is not to say that bees are inefficient in any way because they are also essential. It's just a little bit of a difference there. And moths also have big hairy bodies that carry lots and lots of pollen to transfer between flowers. And then moths are environmental indicators. Right? And an environmental indicator is um, a species that can tell us something about the health of the ecosystem. And so you're probably familiar with the famous story way back to the industrial revolution of the peppered moths that could no longer blend in with the tree bark due to the um, soot and other pollutants on them. And yes, that study has been sort of called into question, uh, but in fact, when we see declines in moths, particularly here in the northeast of our giant silk moth populations, which we're seeing declines, we know that something is not right because these organisms depend on actually various parts of an ecosystem in order to maintain healthy populations. So they have essential functions in ecosystems, but they're also useful to humans, right? So the process of sericulture, which is silk production, has actually been around for thousands of years, which depends entirely on raising and rearing silk moths. And silk is, a, is part of the global economy. And then more recently, um, a company called Novavax, which is in the process, they haven't quite received FDA approval or um, approval yet, a company called Novavax has actually taken moth cells from this moth called a fall army worm and use as using those cells to, as a means to produce COVID spike proteins at large quantities to produce these vaccines. So there's something very current that moths are assisting us with. So to, let's talk about the order Lepidoptera. And let's talk about what makes a Lepidopteran, what is a moth and butterfly. So moths and butterflies are in this order called Lepidoptera. And Lepidoptera means scaly wings. And if you've ever encountered, if you've ever held a butterfly or a moth, you notice, you know that their wings are covered in these feather-like, these feathery scales. Um, and those scales give the wings their unique colors and patterns. And the function of those scales, the scales have several fold functions here. And one of the major ones is predation defense. So the scales can function in predation defense in a couple of ways. They can be what we call aposematic or warning coloration. So these bright colors and patterns that warn predators that the moths are toxic and taste bad. They can be predation defense in the form of mimicry. So here's an IO moth and these moths uh, can open up their wings when they feel threatened and reveal some eye spots that kind of look like owls. And they can be predation defense in the form of camouflage. So here we see a moth that is really well camouflaged against the bark of a tree. And another predation defense that these wing scales serve is that they are an irritant to predator mucous membranes. So what's going on here is this is an owl that is holding a moth that's frantically flapping its wings. And what you see here that looks like snow is actually the wing scales being shed in huge quantities, flying into the eyes and the beak and the mouth of this would-be predator. So scales function a lot in predation defense. And scales also function in mate recognition. So these unique colors and patterns allow them in part, and of course they also rely on chemical signals as well, to recognize members of their own species. And I also have to mention the persistent myth that if you, um, if, a, if a lepidopteran, like if you rubbed off all the scales or it somehow lost all its wing scales, that they can't fly. And that's actually a myth, they can still fly. Um, Lepidopterans can become incredibly damaged. Uh, this is a, a red spotted purple butterfly um, and still are able to fly, um, which is a testament to how great those wings function. Um, but 
I'm not I'm not saying oh go ahead and wipe the scales off <laughs> off of the wings because then they can't um, do their predation defenses effectively. So what it, um, some other characteristics of Lepidoptera is that they have what we call a holometabolous or complete metamorphosis life cycle. And you're probably familiar with this in that they start as eggs and an egg hatches into a larva. And in Lepidoptera, we call those larvae caterpillars. Um, and the function of a caterpillar is to eat as much as possible. Right, which is again contributes to them being essential food for um, bird nestling because the whole function of a larva is to um, gather as much nutrients and put on as much body fat and protein to sustain the pupa and the adult stages. And so the larvae eats, it transitions into a pupa, this transitional stage between um, larva and adult, it's a really fascinating set of. Um, genetic gene expression that goes on to turn off the caterpillar, turn on the adult um, gene expression. And then the adult hatches out with wings whose primary function is to mate, reproduce, lay eggs, and continue the cycle. A little more about characteristics of Lepidoptera. So I mentioned earlier, adults feed primarily by this straw-like mouth part called a proboscis, which means that the majority of them only drink liquids as adults. And in fact, some species take on so much in the way of nutrients as caterpillars that they lack mouth parts entirely and don't even feed at all as adults. And those tend to be the shorter lived species, um, but they lack mouth parts entirely. And caterpillars feed via mandible. So caterpillars eat leaf, leaf material, the majority of their diet, and so they have these jaws called mandibles. So at different life stages, they have different means of feeding or don't feed at all. So then, well, again, a, a main question I get asked is what is the difference between a butterfly and a moth? And I'm here to tell you that evolutionary speaking, there is no fundamental difference between a butterfly and a moth. And in fact, if we, if we look, butterflies are actually moths. So moths evolved um, earlier than, but than the groups we call butterflies. Uh, but what we're seeing here, this is a scientific diagram we call a phylogenetic tree. And all it does is show uh, relatedness between species, okay? And so what, and, and how far back in evolutionary time they sort of diverge from one another. So what I want to point out here on this diagram is the fact that when we look at a phylogenetic tree, we say that closely related species are grouped together. But what we notice here is this group is a group we call moths. This group is a group that we refer to as butterflies. And then here again, we have moths. So really, butterflies are a type of moth that has a couple of different characteristics. There's no fundamental difference between these organisms. But um, I get it. You know, you have an insect in, in your hand and you want to know, am I looking at a moth or a butterfly? So some ways to tell the difference here. But at first, I have to say that in terms of diversity, moth species outnumber butterflies by about 10 to 1. So there's an order of magnitude more moth species than butterflies in the world. But let's get into some of the little minor differences here. So if you're looking at one of the, one of the easiest ways to tell, particularly if you're up close with the insect, is that butterfly antenna are what we call club-tipped. And club-tipped antenna, they have this little bulb at the end, okay? And moth antenna are more variable. So moths um, can have these straight antenna, which we call filiform. Uh, they can have these very feathery antenna, which we call pectinate. And particularly in males, these are used to detect pheromones or sex hormones that females give off to attract mates. So take a look at the antenna, see what you got. Active time is another way to kind of suss out these differences. So all butterflies are diurnal, diurnal meaning they are active during the day. There are no nocturnal butterflies. Butterflies are solely awake during the day. Most moths 
as I'm sure you're aware, are nocturnal, but we do have a, um, a, a handful of species that is active in the daytime. Uh, I love to point out these guys, this gorgeous um, set of species, the hummingbird clear wings that and I'm, I'm biased, that's what I did my dissertation on. But butterflies are di diurnal, most moths are nocturnal, a few moths are out in the daytime. And then wing resting position is another one. So butterflies are gonna, um, when they rest, uh, when they're not actively flying, they'll have their wings sort of spread flat or kind of up folded over the abdomen, um, kind of folded up together. And moths can sit or rest in a couple of different ways, sort of with their wings closed but flat, uh, this kind of tent shape, even rolled up in a tube. Um, or in a similar way to butterflies. And then if I don't mention this, I'm gonna always ask these, wait, 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 wait. Uh, you forgot one of the differences, and that is that butterflies are pretty and moths are ugly. Now, of course, the concept of beauty is highly dependent on the person you're talking to, but I do like to point out here, this is a butterfly and this is a moth. So you tell me about aesthetics, but, uh, and then, you know, to that people say, well, clearly that's a tropical moth um, and all of the moths that we have in the Northeast are probably the little brown kind and certainly none of, none of them are beautiful. But in fact, here's just a sampling of some of the incredibly beautiful um, diversity of moths that are all native right here in the Northeast US. So butterflies are pretty, moths are pretty. Everyone's pretty. So next I'd like to talk a little bit about the conservation threats facing moths and butterflies and insects. So globally, 40% of insect pollinators, mostly Lepidoptera, are at risk of extinction. So let's talk about some reasons why. Globally, the number one driver of species declines, whether you're a moth or a tiger, is habitat loss. The rapid urbanization of the world, um, turning habitat to urban and suburban areas is a huge driver when, when these organisms lose habitat. And in particular, we've all seen suburban areas that look like this, right? This, the lawn. The lawn represents an amazing source of habitat loss directly for Lepidoptera. And I mean, would it kill them to throw in a few purple coneflowers? It would look beautiful, right? And in particular, lawn maintenance. And I like to talk about my least favorite um, machine on the face of the planet, the leaf blower. Now, in addition to the air pollution and noise pollution, these, um, Machines that are specifically designed to clear away leaves for the purpose of I don't know what, uh, making sure you have this year round for whatever reason, directly impacts the way that moths complete their life cycles. Many of them, including the giant charismatic silk moths, overwinter, so they spend the winter in a silk as a pupa in a silk cocoon wrapped in leaves. And so when we remove these leaves, which honestly, I think fall leaves look beautiful when they fall. Um, when we remove these leaves and send them to a landfill or worse to a shredder, shredder, that is direct mortality to these organisms as well as loss of this essential leaf litter habitat. Again, for the purpose of what? And just maintaining the, the work that you have to put in to maintain a green lawn not only in terms of leaf removal, but the way that the pesticides, the herbicides, the fertilizer constantly applied um, really damages ecosystems and in particular damages healthy soil, right? And really reduces the healthy soil environment, the leaf litter environment that many insects, Lepidoptera, but many, many insects depend on for their life cycle. So habitat loss, and in particular, the way that we maintain our suburban environment um, is really driving a lot of these declines. 
And believe it or not, moss can be affected by pollution as well. So traditional forms of pollution, like air pollution from fossil fuel emissions, can actually affect insects and moths. Um, and so this is a composite image, it's not a, a photograph of something that's actually happening in real time. But what's the point here, the research findings here, is that fumes from fossil fuel emissions actually interfere with the way that insects um, can perceive the world around them. Right? And particularly nocturnal insects like moths that depend highly on floral volatiles, these scent chemicals, to find nectar. And they depend really closely on detecting pheromones, those sex hormones, to attract mates of females, um, even up to kilometers away in some cases, can be um, clouded, can be blocked by these fossil fuel emissions and fumes in the environment. And we tend to think, how could, you know, how could driving a car affect a moth? But it does. And then something that we don't maybe think about as much as a form of pollution is light. And light is um, an incredible detriment to nocturnal organisms. And so here's you know, a map of the US, um, right here we are, right here in, the, in the, one of the most urbanized areas of the country, street lights. And I don't know if your neighborhood looks like this at night, but mine certainly does as people have these huge, like especially those horrible LED um, floodlights all over the place in the name of you know, public safety and crime reduction. And I don't know about you, but my neighborhood you know, has almost no, there's no reason to have your lights on all night. And there's actually an entire organization called the Dark Sky Organization devoted to studying light pollution's effect on nocturnal biodiversity. But let's take a closer look um, directly at uh, light pollution on moths. And so what's the problem? What's happening here? So here's an enormous floodlight teeming with insects that it's attracted. You've probably all seen something like this. Um, in, the, in the course of your life, right? And so what are the problems here? They can die, moths and other insects here, can die from direct collision with the lights. And in many cases, those lights are hot and they incinerate insects. So there can be mortality from direct collisions with the lights. It can induce fatal exhaustion. So what's happening is moths are attracted to lights for a variety of reasons. Um, but here, this is, not a re this is not a real light, right? It's not the moon, which is a proposed hypothesis that they use the moon to navigate. Um, and so they fly around aimlessly, wasting their energy. They waste their preciously short lives, waste their time and energy that they should be foraging or finding mates, flying around aimlessly in front of this light with no purpose. And then often, um, again, they become exhausted, they cling to the light poles, uh, and that, when they remain there until morning, results in increased predation by birds, right? And all of this overall leads to decreased moth diversity, decreased nocturnal insect um, diversity in general, and that decreased diversity drives broken food webs. Right? And those broken food webs, when there's not enough insects to feed other organisms, we see declines, particularly in birds, right? Everything is connected. Just because a moth dies doesn't mean it's in isolation, right? The species that depend on them, those food webs break down. And then decreased pollination services as well. And so light is incredibly detrimental to nocturnal biodiversity. And so what can you do? Like you as an individual, right? Like you can't, I mean, you can try to talk to your neighbors. You can try to approach your town and say, can we have these sort of more wildlife friendly street lights? You can try, but what you can do and your own individual land is you can at least provide habitat for moths. And one of the best ways to do that is to provide diverse native plant gardens and reduce these monoculture lawns. 
Okay, so to me, this is incredibly beautiful. I love to see this. This is what I'm working towards on my own property. But I understand it's not for everyone, right? So nobody says you have to convert. I mean, ideally you would. But you don't have to convert 100% of your lawn. Put in some pollinator-friendly planting. And oftentimes, if you've got a butterfly garden, take a look. Moths are there feeding on those same plants at night, right? And so something that you can do is you can install some pollinator friendly plants and reduce your lawn, even a little bit. Even if you're attached to it, you can reduce it a little bit and have some kind of um, balance between providing habitat and having the lawn that you like. So I like to end with this quote um, from, if you, you, may, you may be familiar with Doug Callamy's book, Nature's Best Hope. Um, not a paid promotion, I just really like the book. Uh, and he says, actually, I have to move that in order to read the whole thing. Humans would last only a few months if insects were to disappear from Earth. It is remarkable then that our cultural relationship with insects is not one of awe and appreciation, but one of disgust and animosity. We have created a culture in which insects and their arthropod relatives are maligned. In the name of protecting crops and fighting a few disease vectors, we have declared war on all insects and we kill them whenever we can. We are winning our war against insects at our own peril. And so with that, I would like to invite, well, number one, I'd like to invite you to come to the dark side and get involved in mothing and National Moth Week. Um, and invite any questions and or if, people are interested, I can present some information on specific moth gardening plants or specific ways to do the verb mothing, how to do that, how to attract moths. So with that, I'll take um, any questions that you have. I have not um, monitored the chat at the same time as the presentation. That's all right, I have been. <laughs> okay. So there are a couple questions in the chat. So, um, so the first one is, um, are indoor moth slash butterfly gardens beneficial? Oh, like something like, um, you know, like at the Bronx Zoo type where they have yes. those. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, are they beneficial? So they're beneficial in the way that they spread awareness, right? You, you've probably all heard this quote about, you know, we, we appreciate what we know, we conserve what we love, right? And we love what we know about. And so they spread awareness about moths and butterflies. They often have, they dominated by butterflies, but also have, usually have, I've seen, have a few of those big silk moth type organisms. Um, and so that's invaluable. Getting people to interact with and to know these organisms is a help. Whether it's a help to direct ecosystem function, not likely, although some of them do have, um, if, you, if you're like me and you have to go behind the scenes, they do have breeding um, programs for release in some cases, but that education is valuable. Excellent, thank you. Um, the other question we have is, um, why are they attracted to the lights in general? So I know sure. they're a problem, but why are they attracted to it? So the, the big problem, the big elephant in the room of animal behavior is you can never ask them, right? Wouldn't it be nice if you'd be like, what are, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Right, so many nocturnal organisms from sea turtles to moths use the brightest object in the sky to orient themselves, to navigate. And so generally the brightest object in the sky should be the moon. But when we have all these lights, whether it's diffuse, um, just diffuse lighting through a neighborhood, or it's like a point source, the organisms will be confused. And that's now the brightest object in the sky, right? Either the diffuse lighting that dims everything, um, makes every light less, um, sort of less obvious, or those big floodlights. That then becomes the brightest object in the sky. They navigate towards it, thinking that they're navigating with the moon, which they'll obviously never reach, but they get to these lights, right? And they're disoriented. And then they're flying around aimlessly. And so that's one of the leading hypotheses, hypotheses on what it is that attracts moths to light, that brightest object navigation. 
Very cool. As sort of a follow up to that, um, if people are really trying to sort of reduce sort of light pollution um, in their yards and around there, are there specific times of year that are more important? I know we, we often talk about birds and bird migration, so you want to make sure that we try and reduce light pollution um, for migration. Um, is it sort of the whole, you know, spring, summer, fall season for moths or are there specific times that is most important? Yeah, so given um, the sheer diversity, even, even here in the Northeast, given the sheer diversity, there are moths particularly active um, throughout the entire growing season, spring, summer, fall, and there's even a few that are um, active in winter. So what you can do, you know, I understand people want to have lights at night, um, particularly, you know, if you, back in the day, you could have friends over in the evening, right? Um, I understand people want to do that. So you can have them shut off, you know, at, at a certain time, like they don't need to be on past, say, 9.30 or 10 p.m. or whatever, or you can install motion detectors, right? So it's off most of the time. And then if something's in your yard, um, whatever it may be, that might shut off the motion detector and the rest of the time it's dark. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then somebody did ask that they would love to hear more about um, some sort of moth friendly plants that they could plant in their yard. Absolutely, and, and the other thing I'll do is I have a, I have a handout um, that I have obviously have that as an elect, um, electronic version. So I can send that to Stacy, or you can contact me directly for it, but uh, yeah, sure. Got that, got that ready to go. Um, so here are some, um, so really there's a ton of plants and I just highlight some of these that are particularly good for um, night, providing night uh, nectar at night. So Clethra, sweet pepper bush, um, phlox, here's a moth that's active um, sort of at dusk, but you can see it's on these phlox here. Um, dogbane, is uh, act, uh, producing nectar at night, evening primrose, evening right there in the name, buttonbush, and one of my all time favorite plants, I have so many of these growing in my house, is the um, native honeysuckle, that coral honeysuckle that not only does it provide nectar for butterflies, for moths, for hummingbirds, like, but it's gorgeous, right? And so actually, first we could actually first talk about like, what is a moth looking for in a, in a plant, in a, in a nectar source. So moths actually do have good night vision, but they are using primarily scent to find the flowers. So stuff with a strong scent, lots of nectar to sustain their flight and their body, a tube shape to accommodate the proboscis, and a light color, which is what stands out most at night. Um, but those are not like hard and fast rules and whatever they can find, they'll nectar at. And so a lot of your um, uh, daytime and twilight sort of crepuscular evening plants that you have for your butterflies are also feeding moths, um, both diurnal moths and moths at nighttime. So mountain laurel, Joe Pieweed, I mean, what a great plant for attracting every kind of pollinator. Ironweed, bee balm, who doesn't love bee balm and, and um, bergamot. Milkweed, so help your monarch, help your other, uh, other Lepidoptera pollinators. Leatris, I mean, what a gorgeous plant, those uh, blazing stars, Silene, and then coneflower, right? And so those are some um, of the daytime nectar plants that carry over as well into nighttime and also feed the diurnal moth species. And then the other thing with Lepidoptera is thinking about host, uh, larval host plants. So the adult part of the life cycle, it's like everybody loves to see our um, butterflies and moths flittering around. Um, but a really uh, essential part of their life cycle is feeding those caterpillars, right? And again, attracting caterpillars with these types of plants is also going to feed birds in your, in your backyard habitat. So mountain laurels, buttonbush, I mean, what a, I think, am I saying this about every plant? I think, what a great plant. I love buttonbush. 
Virginia creeper, which people love to pull out, but um, actually hosts several types of moth species. Rhododendron. Snowberry is actually a specific um, host for uh, some of the clear wings, some of these guys. Grapevine, blueberries, again, provide you with fruit in the summer and birds as well. Coral honeysuckle is not only a nectar plant, but a host plant, and various species of rubus, which are the raspberries and blackberries. So those are shrubs and vines. And then trees. Um, so if you know, if you love the giant silk moths, uh, butterfly garden um, is not going to cut it because not only do they not feed as adults, but they require a lot of the various deciduous hardwood. So having a wooded property is nice. I wish I had that. And many, 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 many species of herbs, right? Um, and so those are some of the uh, plants that moths are looking for. So again, real overlap with what's in your butterfly garden. Um, but consider installing some deciduous hardwoods. And in, in fact, um, Talamy talks about oak trees in particular hosting tons and tons of native um, Lepidoptera species that in turn uh, the caterpillars feed birds. And I mean, I, I love Lepidoptera. I love watching birds. I love seeing birds flying in and out of my shrubs like with their mouths full of caterpillars going off. It's, I mean, it's a wonderful thing to witness. Fabulous. Lots of great things. Yeah, I've seen Doug's um, presentation a couple of times and, and he does talk a great deal about um, about the importance of oak trees for the um, for the moth mm -hmm. caterpillars. Absolutely. Alrighty. Um, that was fabulous. Um, any other questions? Um, we're not a big group. So if anyone wants to, you know, jump off of um, mute and ask a question, you're welcome to do that or put it in the chat. Um, we have another, you know, couple of minutes if anyone um, has anything. All right, well, this was fabulous. Thank you so much. I always, I forget sometimes how cool moths are. <laughs> they are absolutely amazing. And again, thank you for having me. I am a professor, so I'm a classroom teacher, but I absolutely love doing public outreach. It's like my favorite thing to do is, is public outreach. Excellent. And, and one more plug for Moth Week. When is it again? Yeah, so um, here we go. It is. I'll sh I'll share that uh, share that slide again. It is National Moth Week Year Ten. Is July um, seventeen through twenty five. And again, if I, we would love to have any data you contribute, and with iNaturalist, with those apps, you don't have to even know what you're looking at because that's an app that does ID for you, right? And so Moth ID is hard. It's hard for me. Um, and so with apps like this, I, if you're not familiar, you take your photo and you can see suggested IDs. Um, and so it really makes it great because a lot of the barriers to doing stuff like this is identification, right? People are like, well, I don't know what I'm looking at. And field guides, you're lugging around your field guides, you're thumbing through them, it's hard to use. Um, so really stuff like iNaturalist has really revolutionized our data collection. Um, so yeah, go to nationalmothweek.org um, to find an event or host an event. Even if it's private, the more events, the better. We love counting up how many we have every year um, or find one year you to participate in. And again, you don't even have to know, like you don't have to be able to ID it and with, with this, these amazing apps like iNaturalist. Fabulous. Yeah, we actually did, if anyone's not familiar with iNaturalist, we did a presentation um, several weeks ago, um, and you can find the um, recording of that on our um, the Bucks Audubon YouTube page. Um, it was a great presentation on sort of how it works and how to, you know, how it all sort of connects and some really great things. And we're having a program coming up in um, some iNaturalist days and a sca iNaturalist scavenger hunt, I believe, um, in early June. I'm forgetting all the details, um, but if you check out our website, um, it'll be there as well. So yeah, we, we, we are huge fans of iNaturalist at Bucks Audubon. Same. <laughs> all righty. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, again, reminder that next week is our um, 
will be our last lunch and learn um and we are going to be talking all about fireflies so perfect seasonal um topic so thank you all so much and hope to hope to see everyone very soon